Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless so when you're a kid there's nothing better than halloween night you wait till dusk to throw on your mask you grab your pillowcase and you meet your friends at the corner of grove street there's electricity in the air and promise well the millers have king size snickers this year what about the feldmans i bet they have those big kit kats you hit up the whole neighborhood after every house, your bag gets a little heavier until you get to Maple Terrace. Every house on the block has a bowl outside, and every single one is empty. But how could that be? It's only 7.30. Did they not buy enough candy? No. This happened. This is uncivilized behavior and we're calling for the death penalty. It's also a crime against Halloween. It's one thing for a bunch of the seventh graders to steal the whole bucket. It's another thing for the parents to be in on it. They're encouraging their kids to help them. We translated. Oh, and except for the Pikachu in the corner, these people aren't even dressed up. This isn't trick or treating, it's just stealing. We live in a society, people. As a homeowner, you put out the big bowl of candy, and there's an understanding that each kid only takes one, maybe two if you leave a note. Save some for the rest of us. When you steal the whole bucket, the whole Halloween ecosystem is upended. What happens when there's no treats? There's no tricks. Or there are tricks. Some punk steals your candy bowl, a couple hours later, your tree, whole house gets teepeed. Luckily, a helpful neighbor, a Halloween hero, stopped over and refilled the bowl, but this isn't the norm. Across the country, punks are stealing all the candy. This is from Long Island, watch. These are adults. They're stealing candy. Plain and simple, this is bad parenting, and it won't stop here. Teach your kid to knock over the neighbor's house on Halloween. The next day, they're shoplifting from Walgreens. Kelly O'Bondi is a mother of nine, yes, nine, from Long Island. God bless her soul. Her neighborhood was knocked over. What the hell happened last night? Jesse, so what I'm realizing is, is that Halloween apparently is now the litmus test for parenting, mm -hmm. okay? It's the reflection of the values or lack of values that we're passing on to the next generation. And basically, these little candy kleptos <laughs> are the results of crappy parenting. And I get it, we were all bad, we did our little thing. You know, we might have took a little more candy than we were supposed to. But if you look at the videos that you showed, this is subpar parenting. You have parents involved. It's just candy. Well, it's just candy now, but when it's a car and you're putting your house up because you have to pay bail for little Bobby and his bad behavior, it's like it's just marijuana. But when little Joey is unfortunately on heroin or little Joey B is, you know, doing what he shouldn't be doing, it's the parents. And if you look at these videos, I saw adults, I saw grown-ups, and there was a video that is my friend, and it really bothers me, the grown man. Her kids were crying Aww. in the house. Crying in the house. She drew a picture, a picture for the little kids that didn't get the candy because the big kid got the candy. Aww. He drove the car, he turned it around, and he came back. He scoped out the house. He scoped it out? He scoped it out. You watched the lights. I watched it. <laughs> this is, this is, this is so you're say, So you're saying it starts with a few Snickers, and next thing you know, they're knocking off banks to feed their smack habit. A Snickers, even a king size, is a buck fifty, maybe two dollars. That's the thing, and a lot of these, 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 
buckets, you see, it's late at night, it's dark. There's six pieces of candy in a dollar store, a, a dollar store bowl. They're taking the bowls. What are you doing with the bowl? You're taking all the candy. Leave the bowl. If your son or daughter, and I know you have nine, if any one of them had tried to pull this, got caught on a ring camera from a neighbor, and the neighbor said, excuse me, um, why don't you come over here and look at this ring camera footage, and you see your son or daughter on that camera, what happens? It, it, well, hmm. I don't know if I can say this, but it wouldn't be pretty because my little klepto candy larceny child would be done. They would have to bring the candy back. They would have to get a job, pay for it, apologize. I would put them on blast. It, would, it wouldn't happen because I'm not wrapped up and taking my selfies with my latte. I'm paying attention to what's going on in my house. God created the family. His design was for a man and a woman to marry for life and raise children to know and honor him as we read in Mark 10 six through nine but from the beginning of the creation god made them male and female for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh so then they are no longer two but one flesh therefore what god has joined together let not man separate children are a gift from god and he cares about how they are raised proverbs 23 13 and 14 do not withhold correction from a child, for if you beat him with a rod, he will not die. You shall beat him with a rod and deliver his soul from hell. When God led the Israelites out of bondage, he commanded them to teach their children all he had done for them, as we read in Deuteronomy 6, 6 and 7. And these words, which I command you today, shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. God desired that the generations to come would continue to uphold all his commands. When one generation fails to instill God's laws in the next, a society quickly declines. Parents have not only a responsibility to their children, but an assignment from God to impart his values and truth into their lives. God disciplines his children, as we read in Hebrews 12, 5 through 7. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? God expects earthly parents to discipline their children as well, as we read in Proverbs 13, 24. He who spares his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. Children are a heritage from the Lord, as we read in Psalm 127, 3. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. The goal of good parenting is to produce wise children who know and honor God with their lives. Proverbs 23:24 shows the end result of raising children according to God's plan. The father of the righteous will greatly rejoice, and he who begets a wise child will delight in him. Failure to discipline results in dishonor for both parent and child, as we read in Proverbs 10:1. A wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is the grief of his mother. Proverbs 15.32 says, He who disdains instruction despises his own soul, but he who heeds rebuke gets understanding. The Lord brought judgment upon Eli the priest because he allowed his sons to dishonor the Lord and failed to restrain them, as we read in 1 Samuel 3.13. For I have told him that I would judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows because his sons made themselves vile and he did not restrain them god tells us what happens if we forget his law in hosea 4 6 my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge i also will reject you from being priests for me because you have forgotten the law of your god i also will forget your children because america has rejected god's knowledge and forgotten his law it seems as though God has forgotten our children. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, 
wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. In the last days, the prophet Zechariah tells us Israel will be the focal point of world conflict and he gives a dire warning to the nations who would dare come against Jerusalem. Zechariah 12, 2 and 3 Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. This prophecy is unfolding right before our very eyes. The atrocities of October 7th, Hamas attacks, they're just beginning of the br brutality. A Hamas official says the terrorists won't stop until Israel is destroyed. Israeli members of parliament were moved to tears after watching raw footage of the brutalities against their people. And yet, President Biden has joined international calls for Israel to pause its offensive in Gaza. CBN Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem. For the first time since the war began, foreign nationals, including Americans, are getting out of Gaza. The U.S. State Department is helping the U.S. citizens there. In the past 24 hours, we have informed U.S. citizens and their family and family members with whom we are in contact that they will be assigned specific departure dates. The State Department says there are about a thousand American citizens and family members in the Gaza Strip. Working nonstop to get Americans out of Gaza as soon and as safely as possible. This is the result of intense and urgent American diplomacy with our partners in the region. President Joe Biden also called for a humanitarian pause in the fighting. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken is departing for Israel and Jordan Thursday as international criticism of Israel builds. Jordan recalled its ambassador, and some are concerned the U.S. will ask Israel to stop its ground campaign. On the ground, the Israeli military announced it's at the gates of Gaza City. Soldiers and tanks are seen in this Israeli Defense Forces video as operations intensify inside Gaza. The IDF says dozens of Hamas targets, including observation posts, anti-tank squads and launchers, vessels and military outposts have been destroyed. Israeli leaders are warning this new phase of the war will be long and difficult. The IDF also released this conversation showing Hamas taking fuel for its war machine from a Gaza-based Indonesian hospital. Turkey and Iran's foreign ministers met Wednesday in a show of solidarity. Iran's foreign minister says the region is on the brink. Undoubtedly, if the war isn't stopped immediately, the United States of America, the fake regime of Israel, and the supporters of the continuation of the war crimes will be directly responsible for the situation in the region getting out of hands. Some 240 people, including Americans, are still being held hostage by Hamas. A Hamas official in Lebanon declared they would repeat October 7th. He said, Israel is a country that has no place on our land. We must remove that country because it constitutes a security, military and political catastrophe to the Arab and Islamic nation and must be finished. We are not ashamed to say this with full force. It is Israel, not us. We are the victims of the occupation, period. Therefore, nobody should blame us for the things we do. On October 7th, October 10th, October millionth, everything we do is justified. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus declares, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For a nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. The prophets of the Old Testament prophesied of these future military conflicts in Isaiah 17:1, in which Damascus, Syria will be destroyed in a single night. Jeremiah 49, the prophecy of Alam, which could infer an Israeli attack upon Iran's nuclear program. Psalm 83, in which the Muslim nations that border Israel will mount an attack on Israel in order to cut them off from being a nation. Ezekiel 38 and 39, known as the War of Gog and Magog. In this prophecy, a coalition of nations led by Russia, Iran, and Turkey 
will attack Israel in the last days in order to take Israel's wealth. In the last days, the prophet Zechariah prophesied Israel would have a powerful military. Zechariah 12.6 In that day I will make the governors of Judah like a fire pan in the woodpile, and like a fiery torch in the sheaves. They shall devour all the surrounding peoples on the right hand and on the left. But Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, Jerusalem. Regarding Israel, um, while House Republicans are leading on approach, we're also leading the charge to support our cherished friend. And last week, in one of my first acts of speaker, we passed a resolution reaffirming our commitment to Israel in its moment of peril. And now, as Israel begins the next phase of its war, it's been kind of disturbing to us. I've heard Democrats uh, suggest that there needs to be a ceasefire. Let us be clear. We've been very clear about this. There was a ceasefire. It was before October 7th, and Hamas broke it, and Israelis suffered unspeakable acts of evil, as you've heard even recounted here this morning. Israel doesn't need a ceasefire. It needs its allies to cease with the politics and deliver support now. And that's what we're doing. House Republicans plan to do that. We're going to do it in short order, and it provides Israel the aid it needs to defend itself, free its hostages, and eradicate Hamas, which is a mission that must be accomplished. All of this, all of this, while we also work to ensure responsible spending and reduce the size of the federal government to pay for that commitment to our friend and ally. We cannot waste any time getting Israel the aid it needs. Genesis 12, one through three. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God's foreign policy is pretty simple. If you bless Israel, you will be blessed. If you curse Israel, you will be cursed. Are you for saving lives or are you against saving lives? The time to decide is now. Cease fire now. Cease fire now. Americans want to cease fire. They want it to stop. Now, when Rashida Tlaib and Cori Bush call for a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas, what do their words actually convey? Solidarity with an oppressed people? Well, to answer that question, we need to listen to the words of Hamas's own deputy foreign minister. <laughs> لأنه بالفعل هي تعتبر كارثة أمنية وعسكرية وسياسية للأمة العربية والإسلامية يجب أن تنتهي لذلك إحنا لا نخجل من نقول ذلك بكل قوة. What about all those dopey college students? They're not marching for justice. They're marching for this. نصي لازم نقدمها وحنقدمها مرة ثانية وثالثة لكن كما قلت لك بدنا ندفع ثمن نعم إحنا مساعدين معلش بقول لك بشكل واضح إحنا اسمنا شعب الشهداء وبنفخر أن نقدم. What about those global humanitarians out there ripping down posters of kidnapped or dead Israeli children? Where does their allegiance lead? To any sane individual, Hamas is a force of aggression. And it's one that delights in the suffering of innocent people. And by the way, they don't give a darn about Palestinians either. But the victimhood propaganda never stops. And just like in the United States, victimhood justifies everything and anything they do. Yes, Israel, not us. We are the victims of the oppression. That's the last point. That's why we don't know what we're doing. On 7 October, on 10 October, on a million October, we are the victims of the oppression. It is justified. There are far too many people living in the United States who believe this, who agree with him. They're even repeating his talking points. We don't want Israel to exist. We don't want these Zionist counter-protesters to exist. Hamas is not radical. Hamas is our freedom fighters. That's our freedom fighters. That's all we have is Hamas. You guys are associating that Hamas is a terrorist organization. It's a resistance. It's a resistance movement, and we need to stand behind it. Scripture plainly tells us all nations, including America, will be gathered against Jerusalem in the last days. I have often wondered what could possibly cause America to turn on Israel. I believe the answer is now clear. We have listened to and watched the anti-Semitic behavior of the squad, also known as the Four Horsewomen of the Apocalypse. The United States government will one day turn on Israel and bring the wrath of God upon this nation. The Italian city of Milan woke up Tuesday morning to this. 
Torrential rain and a violent storm in the early hours caused the river Seveso, which flows under the city, to overflow. Local authorities say they are building huge vats underground to catch the floodwaters, but other cities in the Lombardia region are not so prepared. According to the Italian Met Office, 45 millimetres of rain fell on Milan between midnight and 7.30 a.m. Five regions in the north of the country have orange weather warnings in place, while Veneto is on red alert. But meteorologists say the stormy weather will soon ease before moving south, which is still experiencing an unusually hot autumn. Tonight, a humanitarian crisis exploding in Acapulco, Mexico. After Hurricane Otis ripped through the beach resort town a week ago, destroying infrastructure and flooding streets and homes. Up and down the coastline, the horrifying evidence of Otis's wrath. Boats thrown like toys along the shore. Many residents now feeling as though they've been left to fend for themselves. Queremos ayuda. Ayuda. Se nos fue todo en el agua. No, no, no. Clean drinking water becoming scarce. Authorities say just 35% of water service has been restored. Lines of desperate residents snaking through the streets, people waiting to collect it by the jugful. But the wait itself is dangerous. Looting in the days after the storm stripped store shelves bare. Food now coming from a government-backed community kitchen. NGOs like World Central Kitchen stepping up to meet the demand. Today we are putting out 3,000 meals. Yesterday it was 2,500, so each day we're looking to increase our output more and more. Otis's rapid escalation from a tropical storm to a monster Cat 5 hurricane in just 12 hours, leaving residents like this woman with little time to prepare. She thought the rising floodwaters would be the death of her, her husband keeping her calm through the worst of it, the couple surviving, but now struggling. Mexican president deploying more than 10,000 troops and 1,000 government workers to deal with the aftermath. Government officials unveiling a $3.4 billion recovery plan, but experts estimate the cost of the damage could be as high as $15 billion. The human cost of the storm continues to climb. At least 45 people killed, including one American. Loved ones of those lost seen waiting outside the morgue. Por la falta de luz. This funeral homeowner says he can't prepare bodies for burial until power is restored, now taking in more of the dead than he can handle, while families wait to lay their loved ones to rest. The official death toll is expected to continue to rise with at least 47 people still reported missing. This was Mayfar's family home before last Wednesday when a Category 5 hurricane hit Acapulco, Mexico's Pacific Coast resort town, and reduced it to this. She and 11 other relatives survived by hiding in this passage. We were three hours in here. It flooded. It was halfway up our legs. It was horrible. There were children. Much of Acapulco is now devastated. 80% of the hotels are damaged. But Mayfar echoes many when she says the authorities have yet to help them. We want the government to be here and to support us. It's been a week and they haven't shown up. They have abandoned us. Where Mayfar lives on Campeche Street, the residents themselves have begun the clean-up operation. We're all helping each other as neighbours, as family, because we've never faced a hurricane as strong as this one. There's no electricity yet on Campeche Street, just like vast sectors of the rest of the town, and a lack of food and water too. Here, like elsewhere, that's led to looting. The shop in Campeche Street has been looted, just like almost every other convenience store and supermarket in Acapulco. And that means that a week after the hurricane, you can't find anything to eat or drink in this town, even if you've got the money. Additional security is also part of the plan, but the residents in Campeche Street say the National Guard, already sent to Acapulco, haven't shown up here. They barricade themselves in at sunset, frightened of looters. No one comes in. Not cars, not people. We close off the streets at 7 p.m. and open at 6 in the morning. In a town that this week has spiralled out of control, they're having to rely on themselves. What we are witnessing is just a glimpse of what the seven-year tribulation will be like. As anyone can plainly see, the world is in a state of decay. Moral, economic, political, every way possible. People are saying the world is out of control and looking for someone, anyone, 
to rescue the planet. Soon, very soon, a leader will appear on the horizon that appears to have all the answers, to calm the oceans, to bring peace to all the nations. His title will be the Antichrist, and he will be welcomed by millions of those on earth not taken with the rapture. Unfortunately, his true identity will be known soon to those left behind that his true intentions are death, destruction, and control. So yes, global chaos is the new normal until the Lord Jesus Christ comes at the end of the Antichrist's seven-year reign of terror and establishes true peace on earth. It is evident that planet earth is in the time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. The world is seeing death, destruction, and despair at unprecedented levels. The events the world is suffering through right now, awful as they are, will only get worse. The Bible tells us in the last days, right before Jesus returns, there will be a time of severe distress this world has never seen or ever will see again, as we read in Matthew 24, 21. For then there will be great tribulation, just as it has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. This time of distress Jesus is referring to is called the seven-year tribulation, in which the inhabitants of planet Earth who have rejected God and remain unrepentant in their sin will face his wrath. These terrible judgments are pictured as seven seals opened, seven trumpets blown, and seven bowls poured out. The first four of the seven seals are known as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The book of Revelation tells us when Jesus breaks the first seal and the white horse rides, the Antichrist will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the second seal and the red horse rides, war will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the third seal and the black horse rides, famine will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the fourth seal and the pale horse rides, death and Hades will be unleashed. The Bible tells us 25% of the population of the earth will be killed at this time, as we read in Revelation 6-8. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was death, and Hades followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth, to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. The population of the world is roughly 8 billion, meaning 2 billion people will die during this time. The remaining 17 judgments of God include devastating earthquakes, cosmic disturbances, scorching heat, meteors, 100-pound hailstones, volcanic eruptions, loathsome sores on those who take the mark of the beast, the seas, rivers, and springs of water turn to blood, demons torturing mankind, and a 200 million strong demonic army who will kill another third of mankind, bringing the total to 4 billion. Luke 21, 26 through 28. Men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, 
is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.